Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for weekly updates about my podcasts, events, and more. Also, follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and also at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. And finally, join my virtual book club called Zibby's Virtual Book Club, which meets every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. Eastern Time until 3 p.m. and features half an hour of book club discussion followed by 30 minutes of Q&A with the author whose book we've just discussed. You can sign up on my website, zibbyowens.com, under the virtual book club section, or even on Instagram under the link in my bio. I hope you'll find me in all these different channels and enjoy this podcast. The sponsor for this whole Labor Day Book Blast week is firstbook.org. Obviously, the pandemic is crippling education for millions of students, especially those in low-income communities. The widening digital divide and extended quote-unquote summer slide due to COVID is devastating. Apparently, 40% lack access to reliable internet and functioning digital devices they can use for online learning, making the need for physical books and resources to prevent further educational backsliding absolutely critical. Firstbook breaks down the barriers to education for children living in low-income communities by providing its network of more than 475,000 educators serving children in need with free and affordable new high-quality books, educational resources, and basic needs items through the award-winning First Book Marketplace nonprofit e-commerce site. They need your support to ensure these children have what they need to learn during this critical time. Visit firstbook.org to help Lisa Donovan is the debut author of Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger. She has redefined what it means to be a Southern baker as the pastry chef to some of the South's most influential chefs, including Margot McCormick, Tandy Wilson, and Sean Brock. Unabashedly serving her church cakes and pies to finish fine dining experiences, she has been formative in establishing a technique-driven and historically rich narrative of Southern pastry. Donovan received a James Beard Award for her writing in Food and Wine, where she is a regular contributor, and she has been a featured speaker at Renee Redzepi's globally renowned MAD MAD Symposium. Hi. Hey. How, How are, are you? you? Glad to meet you. I'm, glad to meet you. I'm glad. I mean, I admittedly have been so far up my own ass with this book for the last three or four years, but I am just sort of like finding spaces where I'm like, I can't wait to read like this blog and I can't wait to watch this. Like, so I'm just glad to know of you now. All of the connections that get made when you come out with a book are really special. So I'm glad to know that you're out there. Oh, that's so nice. And I feel like I've gotten to know so many people. I mean, I used to be a big reader anyway, but not like this. Now, yeah. like every memoir, every book I open, I get to know so much about people that our paths might not have crossed in life. And now look, it's like, I don't know, it's like magic. I love it. It it feels like a really special kind of time in that arena of like, I was just talking with someone, we were having like a little pre-interview and he happens to be a really good friend of mine. And we were just sort of, I don't know, just talking. And I said, you know, one of the really great things about this has been making connections with other writers because there have been so many women, you know, writers who have written memoirs this year. And and just like the ability to sort of, and they're all so different. Like Phyllis Grant is a really great example of, you know, someone we kind of came out with memoirs that are very parallel. And we've kind of both like, we've never met, but we've kind of looked at each other like, how have we, I mean, obviously we know we were both doing what you just did this morning, which is like juggling it all and creating this career and creating these lives for ourselves and our families. And we kind of all are like coming out of the woods at the same time. Like, there you are. I knew you were out here. I was just too busy to find you. And now, you know, we're telling similar stories, but in really different ways. It's really special. It's really neat time. It's awesome. Even earlier today, I did a podcast with an author, Alyssa Shalaski, who wrote a book called Apron Anxiety, and it intersperses recipes and stories and then Phyllis Grant also has been on my podcast and you, yeah. and I'm like loving all these food, memoir, like growing yeah. up and experience. Anyway, it's just, if this were real life, I would say, let's all get together. I'm going to do an event with you guys, but you know. That'd be great. Um, oh, I really hope that we can put a pin in all of those things and really make them happen next year. Because it's just, you know, I want this to not be sort of 
it's been very nice and relaxing to be able to do this from, you know, my desk and my bedroom. <laughs> That's been kind of a nice sort of like energy restorative experience. Whereas the traveling, I used to travel a lot as a chef and it, it really starts to take its toll on you when you're traveling four and five times a month, especially when you're flying. And so I was definitely getting a little threadbare in that way. But I really want next year to be sort of like, I'm trying to keep a little ledger of every time I say that or someone says that to me, like event with Zibby and Phyllis. And Will you please put it in? Yeah. I mean, we could do something now. I just feel like it's not as no, great, it's not, you know? It's, it's not, not the not same great. as like when you get a group together. And I yeah. love like pairing people who have so much to discuss and yeah. I don't know. So please yeah. write it down. An energy in a room is so nice. You know, yeah. I'm really starting to miss that like zeitgeist of people talking together and, and, and yeah. you know, an audience listening. And admittedly at the beginning of this, I was like, phew, I don't have to sit on a stage and talk about myself. And now I'm kind of like, but look at all these people that I can sit on the stage with and talk about what our work is, is, you know, is going to be a great opportunity. So I'm, I'm keeping notes and trying to like, remember all of the plans that we're dreaming of now and make them happen next year. So, well, really put me at the top of the list. Once the floodgates have opened and we can all come rushing forward and planning stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Can't wait. Well, so tell me more about writing your book and tell me about when you decided your life would be a book and then how did you take everything that happened and put it on the page? Well, <laughs> you know, it's cliche, I think, as it sounds. I think I'm one of those weird people that always was a writer. Like even when I was a kid, I, I just, that's how I process things. I'm, I'm just a writer. Whether I'm good or bad is to be determined. But like, that's how I process my experiences. And I, you know, did I ever think I was going to write a memoir of this caliber as far as like, personal exposure goes? No. <laughs> like not even close. What I think that there was a, a time in the world that changed and became available where I started to realize that I knew I was going to use, there are plenty of stories in my life that are great material for storytelling and that are good stories in and of themselves. I think in my head, I thought, well, that'll be for novel. That'll be for short stories. That'll be for screenplays. And, and that'll be for like my creative process later in life. I'll use all these interesting characters in different ways as a writer. And then, you know, the world sort of changed. I left the restaurant industry and had a real significant experience, a personal experience with myself of the word is getting so overused, but re a reckoning with myself of like the ways in which I, you know, tried to maneuver the world and the ways in which that was effective. And then also the ways in which I, I know it was damaging to me and other, other women around me and the, the acquiescences that we make and the stories we don't tell, the stories we don't even share amongst ourselves as women and how private and sort of shamefully secret a lot of these stories become for us as we move through the world and really started to take apart what the parallels were between the acquiescences and sort of this very, you know, patriarchal infrastructure, patriarchal and racist system out in the world that we all try to like ladder climb in with this sort of self-accountability of what I was doing to bring power to that world, you know, by keeping these things so private and carrying all of these things as if it were some sort of burden. My own life was a burden to the world, you know, and the, the space that I was going to take up with my stories was burdensome for the world. And so, you know, we, we get these ideas of the ways in which women are supposed to be accommodating. And I really started to get frustrated by the, the boundaries that I had to live in because I was playing that game of not being burdensome to the world. And, and you know, and I wrote the essay about the restaurant industry and it, you know, it kind of got categorized as a sort of me too essay in the, in the larger zeitgeist of the conversation that was happening at the time. And that was a moment for me where like, not only did I realize that how good it felt to get all of that language out of me, the response was really interesting to me. How much people seemed to need to hear those 
small stories that were contained within that essay was a real awakening for me. And it was a real moment for me to realize that there's power in telling our stories. You know, there's power in talking about sexual assault. There's, you know, and and at a time when, you know, it takes 40 women to bring one man down in, in our culture, you know, and that problem in our culture and society rests solely on the fact that we acquiesce and keep these stories to ourselves for so long. And, you know, there's no space for us to, to have the conversations about rape and abortion and about what it means to be a woman in all the ways, beautiful ways, connective ways. Like, so, you know, I, I, it would just felt like a really great opportunity to finally share what was a very true experience for one woman in the world. And I think the more we can start kind of opening up those spaces, I think that's how we can create a societal change about how we treat women in this country, you know? So yeah, I didn't realize I was going to ever write a memoir in this capacity, but it happened. And so here we are. And I look really forward to writing, you know, some fiction and some things that are a little less making me feel completely exposed to the world. There's that level of it too, of like, I do understand for me why this was important, but it's also difficult to lay it all out there bare, you know? Yeah, there's a lot in there. I mean, that's like, (laughs) I mean, some of the scenes I was just like, oh my gosh, Lisa, I can't believe it. The one with your ex and the baby on the bed. And I mean, I won't go into it, but oh my God, my heart was breaking for you. And then the way that his mother even handled your relationship after and just all of it. Mm-hmm. It's just, anyway. And you know, the trick I think of, of, of those kinds of stories is how frequent and common they are mm-hmm. for, you know, for people, women out in the world. And how I think, you know, here I was sort of this figure of note in my, in my arena, in my mm-hmm. industry. And viewed as someone who was no, you know, no nonsense and strong and independent and hardworking and created my own, you know, all of the sort of strong, independent woman tropes surrounded me. And I thought it's really kind of messed up that no one truly understands how a strong woman is built. Mm. They think that we just appear <laughs> And that I really wanted to give some language to what creates and builds these strong women out in the world. It's oftentimes, in fact, probably never ease and, you know, because they just plowed their way through. No, there was definitely something to build that strength and that power and that ability to manage greater circumstances that I think people just assume you were born with, you know, (laughs) it's like, it's like people working out in the gym. I'm like envisioning this like muscle man type of weight area of a gym. Like you can walk in, people have different baselines, right? But you have to go through the pain of lifting for anybody to get stronger, right? So, so you can be relatively strong, but in order to really get strong, you have to put in some sort of, you know, tissue breaking hard work yep. and yep. for for emotional strength it's exactly the same. Yep. Yeah, it has yep. to come out of somewhere. You have to break something down to build it back up again. So. Yeah. Totally. totally. But I wish it hadn't have happened to you that way and <laughs> and all the rest, but ugh. I have to say when I started reading your book, your table of contents and the way that you structured each chapter, the title and the accompanying like food or yeah. it was so brilliant that I like took a oh, picture of that right. page and I have been meaning to post it, but of course I haven't remembered to do so. But oh, I love when I love like I get such a kick out of well-structured and creative, clever formats. So I really loved how you did Thanks. that. Um, Thanks. And, Thanks. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to have chapter titles and then it just sort of started happening really naturally where I was you know, each chapter sort of became an essay in and of itself. And the, <laughs> the, two, the two words that had each chapter sort of became for me almost like an outline. And it kind of just helped me stay on both a thematic sort of structure as well as like a, a feeling of that time, you know. And yeah, so I'm glad you said that. Thank you. Because it, it felt, it just sort of came about naturally. And I was like, well, I'll just keep it. It's, I love it. it. 
<laughs> but when you were writing, like take me through the writing process. Like now you had these titles. Did those, did you have a list of all of them first and then you filled it in or as each one came and like, what was the writing process like? Like, did you, were you sitting right there or where did you write um, all this? And <laughs> this is where I did it all. And sometimes like on the ground in a puddle, <laughs> no. you know, the writing process was, you know, it's the first time I've ever done anything this big. I've written a lot of essays and I've written a lot of larger format sort of things, but I've never written a book. Obviously, it's my first book. It was an interesting process because I had to learn to be messy and that's not something I'm good at. You know, I'm not good at, I, I can be, I am messy in my creative efforts, but I oftentimes don't share that. And the part of, that was so hard about the writing process for me was presenting disastrous work to my editor so that we could work out of it, you know, and that, you know, so I spent a lot of time in those early months of starting this book being really like cloistered in my like, and really trying to edit myself before I gave it to my editor. And it took me some time. And that's just a result, I'm pretty sure of working in a pretty high stress kitchen, being a pastry chef, like my standards for what I'm willing to present are very high, you know, mm-hmm. and like I hold myself to a very high sort of like standard when I'm engaging with another professional. So like in a kitchen, for example, you work on, if you're the pastry chef, if you're a cook or a, a sous chef, it's a little different. But as the sh- pastry chef, as the chef of my department, I would get ideas and I would do all of that messy work very privately, you know, and I would like figure it out and, 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 and do the math and make all the equations work. And then when I had something that felt as close to finished as possible, that's when I would say, hey, I need you guys to taste this. It's going on the menu soon. And then I would take notes and then I would, you know, tweak and, and, and do that kind of stuff. And I think I went into this book with that idea of like, this is, I have to get this right before I show it to her. So it took me some time to get out of that training that my brain was used to. And once she, you know, she brought me closer and she was like, you just got to brain dump, brain dump, brain dump. So there was a lot of stories that just came out and I just let them come out. And then we found our structure from there you know, of like, look, what's our overall conversation here? And for me, it was really important to make sure that the conversation was significantly and nearly entirely about how women engage and find and love and care for each other and all of the complexities of that. I'm really intrigued by the ways in which women move around this world together. There feels like a, there there, it feels like we are all part of sort of this, you know, it, it makes me think of what's in the ocean, the, the, the channel that kind of moves through the Gulf Coast, the Gulf Stream, right? It kind of feels like we all have this similar movement around this world and we all are tethered to this way of experiencing and communicating. And, and there's something really powerful about that. And there's also something very painful about that because of these shared experiences and traumas and things that we experience as women that, you know, frankly, men, you know, I think can understand on some level. It's not like men do not experience trauma, but I think women have very different experiences in the world and we're tethered together in all of these ways. And so that to me was like, I really wanted to talk about the complexities in which women move through this world together. And alone. And so everything sort of became, is it useful to have this, you know, is this story useful to that bigger picture of sort of talking about the complexities of how women engage with one another? And also what I'm hoping to sort of pass to my own daughter, you know, and how I'm hoping to sort of leave her with less of all of this sort of generational undoing and unlearning. I, you know, I'm really I think that is a huge priority for me. And that was a huge priority for the book. So also just sort of keeping to the, those themes. And then I think structurally what happened was I just started taking each chapter like a like it was its own short story or, or short essay, you know, like its own essay. So then, you know, after we sort of 
compartmentalized it that way, we started to sort of do a little bit of weaving so that they didn't feel so chopped. Like it didn't feel like a, hopefully like a short story collection. Like what we wanted was to sort of weave them together. So there were some, you know, it was an evolution of how we could best get all of these things to sort of work as a whole. It was a really beautiful experience. And both of, I have two editors and they're both women. And it was just this really special, really, truly wonderful experience. It's been a really... I mean, Penguin Press has been one of, I think, the most remarkable experiences of my life. And I hope I keep can write for them forever. I mean, Aww. it's a really, really special house. And I'm very proud to be one of their writers. They've, they have taken such good care of this book. I can't even tell you. It's amazing to me. I'm so glad. That's wonderful. So has your daughter read this yeah. book? Parts. <laughs> She's six, she's 15. She'll be 16 in a few weeks. She, you know, I think she's picking it up and putting it down, picking it up and putting it down. And, you know, I think they're nervous. Both of my kids are a little nervous. You know, my son is 20 and he's like, mom, I love you. And I, you know, we had a lot of talks before as I was sort of writing these stories just about like his comfort level and what he was comfortable with me sharing. Cause it's for a while, it was mine and his experience, you know, and and he's like, no, I don't feel like that was my experience. I feel like this is wholly your experience. You worked really hard to make this not a thing I even have to recall. So mm-hmm. like, I feel so incredibly far removed from any of these stories. So, you know, he was fully supportive, but he's also not quite ready to read the book. <laughs> you know, he's like, I think there are just some things I'm not ready to know. Yeah. Yet. And so I'm like, that is totally fair. And Maggie has, you know, read, I don't think she's read it all the way through, but she's cherry picked some chapters. So, and I don't, I actually don't think she's made it to the last chapter, which is interesting because that's the part that like, you know, when my husband read it, he just was, you know, sobbing and he's like, I can't wait for, he, I'm going to cry. <laughs> but he was like, this is such a gift for her. And it's going to be something that she keeps, you know, she can revisit her whole life. Like it exists forever now. And she can look at this when she's 70 and know like this is this was something you felt when she was growing up. And it's like the best gift. And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> because you don't really think about that. You know, you're not really thinking about your audience. And so there was a lot of like, retroactive if you think about your audience too much you'll never write the book you know (laughs) you'll never like you'll just be obsessed with like who's going to think what of who what and you're gonna you know and as much as I tried to you know I it was really important to me to not blame anybody or indict anyone even people that deserved blaming and indictment you know it was really important for me For this to be about my own work, my own internalized undoing and unlearning and really taking some things apart that, yes, I can assign blame to, you know, I think my grandfather takes the biggest hit here, you know, but it was really important to me to make this about what I learned and how I moved forward from these experiences and why, you know, so yeah, I hope that the messaging kind of makes its way with ease, you know. But there's always, you know, there's always more, more time to write books, hopefully. <laughs> are you thinking, are you already thinking about your next book? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Memoir? Yeah. Fiction? No. <laughs> One memoir is enough. I mean, you know, maybe if I can, that, I, should, I shouldn't say that, you know, there, the next memoir doesn't have to be you know, quite so guttural. (laughs) I can be a little, you know, when I think about Ruth Reichel and Nora Ephron sort of, I think everything will always be a little obviously reflective of my own life. And I think there's so that I value that so much in how women tell stories and, you know, I have plenty of material to use. (laughs) (laughs) I'm working on some other projects that are not nonfiction. So it's exciting for me to sort of take, take these stories and have a little bit more freedom, you know, because there's, there's some, you know, lots of rules with memoir. You have to really hold yourself accountable in every, well, you hold yourself accountable, hopefully as a writer anyway, but you're holding yourself accountable to truth and fact and data. And you worry about, you know, am I getting this right? You know, 
am I remembering? You know, is, I was talking with Dave Chang on his podcast last week and he, he wrote a beautiful memoir and he sent it to his sister and his sister like emails him saying, David, I love you. I don't remember it this way at all, but I'm glad that you had a space to write it. And there's that experience of, you know, what truth lives in each experience for each individual. And so you're sort of faced with that reality of like, you're, everyone's having their own personal moment that is very different than the person standing next to you. And so, you know, memoir keeps you in these really rigid, you know, boundaries of making sure you're holding accountability to truth. Whereas if you're doing nonfiction, you have a lot more freedom and you get to, you know, you get to play a little bit more. But it was a good first exercise. And I, you know, eventually maybe I'll write more memoir. I would love that. And, you know, I've gotten all the hard stuff out of the way, hopefully <laughs> not. <going on. laughs> you know, so, but right now it feels really good to, to be in a space where the creative part of my brain really gets to play and create character profiles and it's fun, you know. And what is your relationship like these days to to baking and chefdom and creating and cooking and all of that? Oh, you know, it's always going to be my first love, you know. I mean, writing is so much a part of who I am that it doesn't even feel like a vocation or a hobby. Like it feels so much a part of, again, just sort of how I process and move through the world. And baking has... I think really, truly one of the first like vocations and crafts and tactile work that I fell so in love with that like I recognize in my husband, like he's a ceramicist and like his affinity and his education and his passion for the material is so familiar to me and the way that baking feels for me. It will always be be in that. It will always be that for me. I will always have a very deep visceral response and connectivity to baking. I, you know, the food world is in a hard place right now, the, in a, in a great place in some ways. They're having really important conversations about food justice and all of these things are incredibly important and timely and necessary. And I'm not to say like, I'm, <laughs> I'm piecing out because it's getting hard. That's not what I'm saying. I just, I feel like it's a good time to, I don't know, let some younger people have the, this, the space in that world, you know, and there's a lot of really great energy happening from like the 20 to 35 year olds coming up and they've got a lot to say. And I am so happy to sit and hear what they are bringing to the table. And I don't know that you ever age out of a conversation like that, but I am also self-aware enough to know that I'm learning a lot from these younger writers in the food space. And this quarantine has been a really great opportunity to like, chill out and listen and read and learn, you know, and some of it I'm really excited about. And some of it, you know, I, I think is still needs some work. You know? <laughs> so, but, you know, I am really glad to be in a space where I've kind of earned the opportunity to, to do work in a different way. You know, I was always out in the streets. I was always, you know, front line of the hard conversations and I'm not scared of those things, but I'm also sort of getting to an age now where I want to do something that's a little bit more dedicated to something that builds and cultivates and in and even in a really private way, you know, and I'm getting really comfortable with wholly being a writer, not a chef writer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's been a real joy and partially a relief to hear people say this shouldn't even be in a food memoir category. This is just a, you know, it's hard to even call you a chef now because your writing, you know, seems to be so much your focus. And that's been really nice to hear because that's sort of been my goal is to, you know, you can't, cook in the kitchen forever. And I, you know, I never made sense with the banks or the investors of how to open my own space. And in this time, I'm really glad, you know, that I'm not saddled with trying to, you know, I have so many of my best friends are trying to keep things 
you know, from just completely falling apart, you know, right now. And it's a really hard time to be a chef and a restaurateur. And so I think this, this time has really given me this, this lockdown, this quarantine time has just given, I think a lot of people the space to really refocus, you know, like what their intentions might've been before life kind of carried them away, you know? And I feel like I'm in that space. And, you know, what I'm really, I don't think I ever would have given myself permission to stop cooking in, you know, as a private chef or doing consulting or developing recipes unless the world had sort of made me stop. Yep. And and just this this little amount of time away from my perpetual insecurity of like not losing potential income. <laughs> like I will never have that. And that even turned, this time's even turned like that on its head where you realize we don't need as much as we thought, you know, we actually need a lot less than we, you know, we're working so hard for. And if the trade-off is, you know, getting to work in my yards, you know, 10 hours a week or getting to go on long walks with my husband or cuddling up with the dog for an hour a day, like, okay, I'm I'm down. I like, guess a good trade. <laughs> Do it. <laughs> so, yeah, I think my relationship to the food world is one that will always exist, but I definitely can actively say I'm working hard so that I can just write full time. And again, like I'll probably always write about food in some way or my experiences as a chef because I think that's the well from which I draw my writing material. But I, you know, I want it to transcend sort of this food media conversation. I'm growing less interested in, in that and more interested in making something beautiful out of the same kinds of conversations and sort of making more cultural experiences for people than hard-nosed, like, fuck it all, you know? <laughs> uh, that's starting to feel less useful to me than it once did, you know? Yeah. So. Aw. Well, Lisa, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on Mom's Don't Time to Read Books. Thank you for sharing all of your amazing thoughts. I feel like I could listen. You have such like a soothing, like centered voice. And I feel like I could just sit here and listen to you forever. So I don't know, maybe a podcast is in your future. I feel like you should uh, take it on the road, you know, that could be really fun for you. As a, the world is all of our oysters now. We just can't. Yeah, make right. We want happen. Whatever you <laughs> Why want. Not? Why not? <laughs> I will have a great nice day. And it was so nice to talk to you. And please keep our event on the top of your list. I, I will. I will. We will do it. And now it'll be like one of my post quarantine goals. So, <laughs> all right. Well, good. Well, take care of yourself. Thank you. You too. Talk bye-bye. to you soon. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks so much to firstbook.org for sponsoring this Labor Day book blast. Please consider giving to firstbook.org to help their network of 475,000 educators serving children in need. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thank you.